It's my uh, uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. M Michael Hall as our second speaker. Mike received his uh, uh, PhD at Harvard in 1981, working with Tom Silhavi. Um, and I got to know him when he came that year to UCSF uh, as an outstanding uh, postdoctoral fellow with the late Ira Herskowitz, my dear friend and, and uh, colleague and next door neighbor, uh, next door lab neighbor at the time. Um, uh, so I got to know Mike uh, fairly well through, through that connection. Um, in 1987, Mark, uh, Mike uh, moved to Basel uh, to start his own lab, the Via Centrum. Uh, uh, I actually wondered whether he would uh, succeed there because uh, I didn't know if he'd be happy because he demonstrated while he was at, in San Francisco uh, that he was an exuberant partier, let's put it that way. Um, I think we're still fixing the damage in my house. Uh, um, uh, but he did succeed, and he did stay, so I guess he's happy there. Uh, he started uh, w doing yeast genetics and molecular biology uh, uh, to investigate the cell cycle. Um, uh, and after completing, uh, in, in, he's, he's stayed in Basel, as I said, in fact, gotten involved in administration there. He completed two terms as chairman of biochemistry, uh, term as uh, the deputy director of the institute. Um, uh, and during that time really rose to international leadership in cellular signal and signaling and growth control. Um, uh, that rise began in 1991 by my reckoning uh, when Heitman, Mova, and assistant professor, then assistant professor Hall, um, uh, published a, a wonderful science paper describing the discovery in yeast of the target of the immunosuppressive uh, agent uh, rapamycin. So a target of rapamycin tor, uh, a protein um, that arrested cells in G1 uh, when bound by that, uh, by that drug. So he went on to show that TOR is a conserved uh, nutrient, energy, and insulin-activated protein kinase uh, that operates in two complexes, tor TORC1 and TORC2, uh, to integrate multiple signals and exert um, really uh, exquisite um, signal responsive control over cell growth and metabolism, uh, really the beginning of our, of our deep understanding of those networks and the ways that they intersect. Um, as such, uh, TOR plays a key role in development and aging. It's been implicated in disorders such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, and so forth. Mike is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences, and the US National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's received numerous awards and prizes in addition to the 2014 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Mike back to the Bay Area for his talk, Future Directions in Cell Growth and Research. Well, it's great to be back, and uh, thank you, Keith, for being so discreet. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the urge is to reminisce, but we are asked to talk about the future, uh, and uh, we have only 20 minutes to do so, so I should uh, get right to it. Uh, the, um, what I'd like to talk about is two future directions. Uh, uh, we, the, the assignment we have was to talk about future directions in our lab over the next five to 10 years. And I'd like to talk about two future directions. One is, uh, is more basic research, and the second one is a translational uh, research uh, uh, project. But first, let me introduce you to, to TOR. So TOR is a, uh, as Keith mentioned, is a kinase, a protein kinase, a very highly conserved protein kinase, conserved all the way from yeast uh, to human. Um, and it's also the target of the anti-cancer uh, and immunosuppressive drug rapamycin. That's, in fact, how it was discovered. So let me begin uh, by the introduction of TOR by giving you some historical uh, perspective. Uh, so on the uh, left here, you see the very first ever model of TOR uh, published, uh, published in 1991, shortly after the discovery of uh, a TOR. Uh, this is actually a model we published, and I uh, actually admit I'm embarrassed we published this model. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't say much other than TOR exists. There's not very much valuable information there. Uh, the, the pictures become considerably more complex uh, uh, today, and even this model is, is, is woefully uh, uh, out of uh, date. Uh, 
And what's driven this uh, increase in complexity uh, since the discovery of TOR, and TOR uh, 1991 makes it a relatively young uh, signaling uh, protein. Uh, uh, so this, uh, th this increase in complexity has been rather rapid. Uh, and what's driven uh, this increased complexity is the fact that TOR turned out to be both clinically uh, and fundamentally important. Uh, and this, of course, has recruited many different kinds of investigators, basic researchers, clinical investigators, uh, and uh, pharma industry, which, of course, has created a large industry, which is then uh, a large community studying this, uh, this pathway, uh, which is then responsible for this increase in complexity. So what is the actual role of the TOR uh, signaling pathway or the TOR uh, protein? Well, its role is to control cell growth. Uh, and uh, my favorite experiment demonstrating this, uh, it's been shown by many labs, uh, including our own, but this is my favorite experiment. Uh, it's certainly the most photogenic experiment. It was done by, one done by Tom Neufeld at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and Tom isolated a TOR mutant fly. And of course, this reflects how highly conserved the TOR pathway is. Uh, he isolated this TOR mutant fly. And it's important to point out that this is a so-called hypomorph. It was a complete loss of function. This uh, fly never would have been born. TOR is absolutely essential for viability. And when Tom obtained this fly, as you can see, it turned out to be perfectly proportioned, smaller but perfectly proportioned. And then he asked the question, why is this fly smaller? Is it smaller because it has fewer cells, or is it smaller because it has smaller cells? And he can answer this question by looking in, in the wing, which is a plane of cells, so it's easy to measure uh, the, uh, the size of the cells and the count the number of cells. And the answer he, he obtained was that this, uh, this fly is smaller uh, uh, because every single cell is slightly smaller. Uh, the number of cells is normal. Uh, so of course, this illustrates very graphically that the role of TOR is to control cell growth, cell size, and ultimately, thereby, uh, organ size and eventually size of the whole animal. So how does TOR do this? Well, again, work uh, from many labs has shown that TOR controls a large number of processes which collectively determine mass accumulation and thereby uh, size of the cell. And these processes can be subdivided into two groups, the anabolic processes which TOR activates and the catabolic processes which TOR inhibits. So TOR balances, balances these opposing forces of synthesis and degradation such that the cell accumulates the appropriate amount of mass uh, in response to, and this is important, response to nutrients. So TOR is a nutrient-activated, highly conserved kinase. Now, how does TOR actually control all these processes? Well, there are signaling pathways emanating from TOR to control key uh, proteins involved uh, in all these uh, uh, processes. Uh, we don't know what those effector pathways are in many cases, but we do know in some. Uh, here is an update on, or an overview of the so-called TOR signaling network, and we don't call this a pathway anymore, we call it a network, because it's actually made up of more than one pathways, because uh, what's been found, and this is in mammalian cells, that's why we call it mTOR now, not uh, simply TOR. Um, uh, what's emerged is that TOR is actually part of two uh, uh, structurally and functionally distinct kinases. So TOR is actually two kinases, it's not one kinase. Uh, each signaling through its own downstream substrates to control these different processes I showed you on the previous uh, slide. Uh, and like in lower model organisms, it's also controlled by nutrients, amino acids in particular. Uh, so the picture that's emerged here is that TOR is a primordial or ancestral signaling pathway or network which has been conserved throughout eukaryotic evolution uh, to control this very fundamental process of uh, cell uh, growth. Now, one exception to what I just said is this part of the network up here, which is the growth factor pathway, which was grafted on to the more primordial TOR pathway. This evolved with multicellularity. Uh, the rest already existed in unicellular organisms. And the reason for that is that growth control in metazoans is more complex than in uh, unicellular organisms because in multicellular organisms, it's, it's important to coordinate the growth of every cell in the body with every other cell in the body uh, to achieve uh, uh, overall uh, growth, growth over a overall body plan. In other words, so our organs end up being properly uh, proportioned. So 
Um, uh, another interesting aspect of, uh, of the uh, uh, TOR signaling network is that it's been uh, genetically linked to an unusually large number of uh, diseases. And what all these diseases have in common is that they're characterized by uh, ectopic growth. And this can be uh, malignant forms of uh, growth or benign forms of growth. It's been calculated that TOR uh, contributes to tumorigenicity in 70% uh, of all uh, tumors. Not quite sure how that figure was generated, but that's the figure that's bandied about. More recently, uh, TOR has been implicated in another set of disorders, metabolic disorders. We know that high, uh, chronically high levels of circulating nutrients uh, can uh, upregulate TOR and thereby adipogenesis, uh, even in the absence of growth factors. Uh, and this can, of course, lead to diabetes, but there's also a more direct link to diabetes where there's a negative feedback loop where TOR negatively regulates uh, signaling through the insulin pathway to confer insulin insensitivity. Uh, in this con interestingly, in this context, rapamycin could even be used as an anti-diabetic drug uh, in addition to anti-cancer and immunosuppressive by virtue of inhibiting this negative uh, feedback loop. Uh, but I don't think anybody's actually... Uh, uh, investigated that uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in industry. So uh, this gives you an overview, I hope, of TOR signaling. It's a highly conserved pathway to control cell growth. Uh, what are we going to be doing in the next five to ten years? Well, uh, one uh, future direction uh, is to understand how TOR controls whole body growth in multicellular organisms. We have a fairly good idea how TOR controls growth of single cells. The, uh, but now we have to understand how it controls growth uh, in multicellular organisms over a whole body plan. And this involves understanding the non-cell autonomous or non-tissue autonomous function of TOR. In this direction, research was uh, inspired by work from a, another fly geneticist, in this case, Pierre Leopold, who was, uh, his work he published a few years ago, in which he was looking for mutant flies which had a, a growth defect. And what he isolated was a, a, mut a mutant which was defective in an amino acid transporter which was specific to one tissue in the fly, the fat body. So each one of these uh, ovals uh, or uh, uh, schematic uh, drawings here are a, are a different tissue in the fly. Uh, what he found was that this uh, loss of this specific, uh, tissue-specific uh, amino acid transporter uh, led to uh, uh, a smaller, this prevented amino acids getting into the cells of this tissue, which uh, caused the cells of this one tissue to be smaller because TOR couldn't be activated, uh, and the fat body was smaller. That was completely expected based on everything we knew about TOR signaling until that point, but was extremely surprising and completely unexpected was that not only was the fat body smaller, but every other tissue where TOR signaling should be normal was also proportionally smaller to match the fat body. So this told us that there was actually TOR-dependent signaling between tissues to, to control growth over a whole body plan. Uh, and I, this uh, uh, uncovered, uh, to my mind, a completely new level of regulation of how uh, growth is regulated in uh, metazoans. So we decided to pursue this. Uh, the way we've done it not is, in, not, is not in flies. But in, uh, in mice, we made uh, mice where we could conditionally knock out TOR complex 1 or TOR complex 2. Uh, and uh, we've just started this. And uh, uh, here is one example of, uh, of what we found. This is a TOR complex knockout in adipose tissue. And much to our surprise, these mice end up being larger than the wild type mice. And upon studying these mice a little further, what we've unco uncovered is there seems to be a signaling act axis, a TOR-dependent signaling axis from adipose tissue to liver and to pancreas, which uh, uh, controls overall uh, IGF and insulin levels, which then uh, control systemic growth and metabolism. So this is uh, one interesting finding we've, uh, we've uncovered by looking at one of the complex and one tissue. Uh, we're looking now in other tissues, focusing on metabolic tissues, because we think that's where most of the interesting findings will, will be. But we're also sending these, uh, these mice out to the community, uh, to anybody who wants to knock out TOR complex one or two in their tissue of choice. 
and I think uh, one day, this is a Manhattan-like project, we'll be able to assemble all this uh, data and understand how, how growth is uh, controlled uh, over a whole body plan. So that is uh, uh, future direction number one. Future direction number two uh, is the more translational project. Uh, and this uh, focuses on understanding uh, mechanisms of evasive resistance in cancer. And uh, this uh, starts with the following problem. Uh, these are, uh, of course, Jim, Jim will probably change all these figures very soon. Uh, but these are the five-year cancer survival rates uh, in various different, uh, in various cancers uh, about uh, in 1979 and more recently. And as you can see, there's been improvement but the improvement has been rather disappointing. Uh, and uh, this disappointment is com compounded by the fact that the, uh, the scientific community has uncovered all the so-called oncogenic signaling pathways, which we heard about in the panel discussion uh, this morning. This, in turn, has led to the development of many targeted therapies, uh, uh, specific uh, protein kinase inhibitors, for example. Uh, and this has been a... a, a a tremendous effort by the community. Uh, they've generated an amazing uh, set of weapons. These are all uh, specific targeted therapies. There have been about 30 uh, targeted uh, therapies uh, generated over the last 30 years based on this knowledge of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the signaling pathways involved in cancer. So uh, given this, why uh, has there been so much disappointment in, in the curing of cancer? Well, the uh, disappointment is due to the fact that these uh, drugs, uh, although they work, they don't work very well. There's benefit, but it's very short term. This is one example. I can give you many other examples. This is serafinib in the treatment of liver cancer. Uh, it, it extends survival by about three months. And this uh, poor extension of survival uh, you see over and over and over again. I think there's one exception among all those uh, drugs I showed you, which would probably be uh, Gleevec in the treatment of CML. So why are these drugs not working, uh, uh, despite the fact that we know they actually target and inhibit uh, those targets which we know are involved in cancer? Well, uh, let me, uh, to explain this, let me give you two examples of what's been found in the literature, working mainly with cell lines and mice. Uh, there are two reasons why these drugs don't work. One is that the tumor is intrinsically resistant to the drug. The drug doesn't target the right pathway. But more commonly, uh, the uh, cancers develop evasive resistance to the drug, also, also referred to as adaptive uh, resistance. So here's an example. Uh, this is from the labs of uh, Baselga and Engelman. Uh, in one case, in uh, skin cancer, uh, they found that uh, uh, cells, tumor cells, which are resistant to uh, BRAF inhibitors or uh, MEK inhibitors, which are commonly used in me treat melanoma, uh, resistance to these drugs correlates with hyperphosphorylation of S6, which is downstream of mTOR. So somehow, activation of TOR allows the cells to circumvent uh, the block uh, uh, of this pathway here by this targeted therapy. Similarly, in, in, uh, in breast cancer, uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, resistance to these also correlates with hyperphosphorylation of S6. So again, here we can get uh, 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 resistance uh, to, these, uh, uh, to these drugs. So this is valuable information uh, because uh, it tells us that the most effective therapy uh, 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 for these uh, cancers uh, is not uh, these uh, drugs alone, but a combination therapy which would affect this and this pathway. Uh, the problem is we don't know in most cases what these compensatory pathways are. They're activated, which confer this evasive resistance. We don't know how they're activated, and we don't know how they compensate for the blocked pathway. So uh, we uh, intend to uh, approach these uh, problems by looking in liver cancer. And uh, uh, what we will do is, uh, is collect uh, 
um, biopsies from uh, patients when they come into the clinic with this long coaxial needle, uh, and we'll take biopsies from the tumor and non-tumor tissue from the same liver as far away from the tumor as we can get. These biopsies are rather small, 10 milligrams, from which we can isolate one milligram of protein. Uh, these uh, patients will then start their therapy, targeted therapy. We will then continue to monitor them, uh, again, taking uh, uh, biopsies uh, on treatment. These, the original biopsy and uh, any additional biopsy we will take uh, for the lifetime of the treatment of this patient, uh, we will uh, uh, look at with many high throughput methods. We will, of course, first show the, the uh, biopsies to the pathologist to make sure that they are clean uh, biopsies. Uh, we'll then determine the proteome, the phosphoproteome, the transcriptome, uh, the exome, uh, and eventually integrate all this data uh, and to understand what, uh, what caused the tumor to begin with, uh, but more importantly, since some of these biopsies will be taken from the patients after they've developed resistance uh, to the target therapy, we'll understand uh, what changed, what signaling pathways will have changed. And this, of course, can be seen uh, very easily by looking at the phosphoproteome uh, of these biopsies. This is pushing the envelope. Nobody has published a, at least a phosphoproteome on, these, uh, on such small samples. We've been working on this for the last uh, year or two to develop the, the methodology to do this. Uh, we've also recruited uh, patients. Uh, we have a number of patients enrolled. Uh, we've started this study. Uh, uh, it's a very high risk study uh, because uh, we will have to compare, we have to do, in the case of proteomics, we'll have to do quantitative proteomics uh, to compare uh, the two biopsies from the same patient. Uh, we'll have to also compare all the biopsies the data from all the biopsies from that uh, same patient taken at different times, and also uh, to all uh, uh, the biopsies taken from all the patients uh, uh, at all different times. Uh, this, and this is an, against a background of high uh, heterogeneity of gender, age, diet, and disease. Uh, so this is not a trivial task, uh, but I think it's what's essential to, uh, to solve this problem of how evasive make, uh, evasive resistance to uh, targeted therapies uh, evolved. I see I've run out of time, uh, uh, but I want to uh, remind you that this involves not only looking at phospho phosphorylation by proteomics, but also with the genome uh, sequencing. We'll integrate all this data uh, to make uh, a testable hypothesis, which we can then uh, uh, test. This uh, is not a minor project. It's not my lab alone. Uh, this is done in collaboration with a clinician uh, Marcus Heim, uh, a tumor biologist, Garrett Christofori, two computational biologists, which will, which will help us integrate and model these vast amounts of data, which will generate, uh, and of course, uh, my lab as well. And I think I'll end there and uh, I apologize for going over time. Question over here. Are you talking about primary hepatoma or all kinds of We're talking about uh, primary, yes. We've looked at all the obvious candidates, and none of them seem to be involved. Uh, uh, we're not even sure that uh, that signal, that must be a soluble signal, which is secreted by the fat to act on the liver and the, uh, and the pancreas, we're not even sure it's a protein. It could be a lipid, uh, S1P, for example. Or, uh, uh, everything is still on the table, and we're methodically going through this, uh, in, in particularly doing proteomics on, on plasma to find out what that signal might be. But we've ruled out all the obvious things. Just to follow up on that, it makes sense that you would start with metabolic tissues, as you said. Mm -hmm. but, but it would be an interesting experiment to look in some tissues that aren't thought to be signaling mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. to see if you could pick up something of that. Have you, have you picked out any yeah. tissues to try? The, the question was, we're focusing on metabolic tissues. Uh, and I don't have time to explain why that is. Uh, but. Uh, 
Uh, the question is, if you look in non-metabolic tissues, you might uncover uh, unknown, unknown signaling between, uh, they might be signaling tissues which had not heretofore been appreciated as signaling uh, tissues. Uh, we are not doing that, but many of our collaborators all over the world who we sent these mice to are doing this. Uh, almost every tissue you can think of is being looked at by somebody, but we're focusing on the metabolic tissues. There's one more question over here. Um, Hi, in the fat bodies, the amino acid transporter that was mutated, was it just a general amino acid transporter or was it for specific types of amino acids? As I recalled, it was a, a general amino acid transporter. But I'm not absolutely sure on that. It's called SlimFast. Okay. Okay. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Yeah.